Fighting Through Podcast, episode 72. More CBs, stories, and much more. More great unpublished history. Hello again, and another warm World War II welcome to the Fighting Through Second World War Podcast. I'm Paul Cheel, and you know the rest. This is just a short, unplanned episode to cover some follow-up I've had on the CBs episode. I decided that rather than keeping everybody waiting for the next episode, I'd share it with you now whilst the last episode might still be fresh in your minds. Lee Patrick from Atlanta in Georgia in America has written in with a great family history and um, before I... So he's the inspiration for the episode really and I'm very grateful to him. And the backstory to him writing really, I'm going to give you it now, it's the uh, incident related by John Serra in the PS in the last episode and I'll tell you what John said first, which so inspired Patrick in turn to write in. John's story picks up after the Japanese submarine incident. After that Japanese sub-incident, we continued on and came in sight of the islands of Okinawa, where we saw a huge smokescreen. We couldn't see the shoreline or ships because it was all milky white. As we approached, some of the Jap planes were flying overhead. Turned out they were kamikaze planes, suicide planes that could crash down and land on ships and hope to destroy them by setting them on fire. We were there three or four days before we unloaded our ship. In the meantime, the kamikazes were coming at us for what seemed like 24 hours a day. We were completely surrounded by the milky smoke screen. On one particular day, I think it was a Sunday, a kamikaze hit an LST right close to mine that was starting to unload. Luckily for us, it missed our ship and we continued to unload. This all impressed us because some of our equipment was slow moving on land and we couldn't unload until they were further down the road. The roads were very narrow in Okinawa and the unloading areas were like small pads None of it was really made for handling all the equipment that we had. The weather was not the greatest. (laughs) I had to chuckle at the end there. (laughs) Nearly got their heads blown off by a kamikaze and they still had time to think about the weather. Anyway, off the back of that, uh, straight into a family story from Lee Patrick, as I say, Atlanta in Georgia. And Patrick's a new listener. He says... Thank you for the Battalion Artist episode, Outlining the CBs. I'm a newcomer to your podcast, and I've been enjoying it for the past two weeks. I tried to listen to the series in order, but couldn't resist skipping ahead to the fighting CBs. And that's because my grandfather, Marion Patrick, was Chief Warrant Officer in the CBs, the 79th, same as John Serra. Unfortunately... My grandfather passed away when I was an infant and I missed out on any first-hand information. However, my grandmother relayed a few stories about his time in the Navy. According to my grandmother, the only time he was truly afraid was on Okinawa. A kamikaze hit the transport next to his as he was unloading equipment. Hearing John Serra's account of this same incident sent Chills down my spine. (sighs) Listen, I wonder if they were on the same boat. Gosh. Second, on Okinawa, they were setting up buildings of some sort at a particular location. This construction brought protest among the locals. Lacking interpreters and being on a timeline, they continued their work, ignoring the yammering language from the natives. Later... When the monsoon season arrived, they found all the buildings on that site were taken away by the winds. Obviously, the locals were trying to warn them of the danger. My grandmother was able to reside in Oakland, California while my grandfather was there during training. She rented a small residence with three other newly married women in the same situation. The landlord was a little old widower in his 80s. 
all four of the young brides became pregnant within a month of each other. My grandmother said the neighbourhood joked about the situation, saying things like, we didn't know that little old man still had it in him, and that old guy sure took advantage of his situation. That reminds me of a story about a farmer who lives not too far from where I do, who uh, married a, a young bride. This was some years ago. I think he was in his 80s, and uh, she was only about 20-odd, and uh, he couldn't keep his hands off her. So after a while, he sacked all his hands and bought a combine harvester instead. <laughs> Olden's but goodens. Lee continues... Upon his return home, my grandfather told of the literal mountains of sugar left in supply depots on Okinawa. This upset my grandmother immensely, since sugar was in such short supply in the States. And during the war, canned salmon was a rare commodity in their hometown of Atlanta. My grandmother hoarded it, thinking it would be a nice surprise for my grandfather upon his return. Unfortunately, canned salmon was akin to canned spam for the men in the Pacific. He was not thrilled to see the cans of salmon waiting for him at home. Somehow, my grandfather was able to make trips to China while waiting on his transport home. He brought back some silk clothes with various other small souvenirs. I always wondered what other memories he'd have shared if given more time. Thanks for putting together this podcast Generations will have the opportunity to hear these recounts where past historians could only dream of having such information. Thanks again, Lee Patrick. P.S. My great-uncle, Perry Patrick, is said to have trained Chinese fighter pilots. We think the base was located in Waycross, Georgia. If you ever hear of an Army Air Corps base training Chinese pilots, I'd love to hear about it but my own internet searches have yielded very little. So over to the army of listeners on that one, Patrick. And Patrick's given us a PPS. The German boy soldier memoir absolutely broke my heart. And um, I'll just add to that that the download rate for that German boy soldier episode is breaking all records at the moment, so if you haven't seen it yet, I would thoroughly recommend it. We've had very good feedback on it. I think anyone hearing Lee telling us how he's just started the podcast will feel a tinge of envy that he's got all these episodes to devour, and I'm wondering if there's anyone who's up to date with the show who's been listening from the start in 2013. How's it been for you? Because I have no idea how many people have stayed the course since then. Anybody out there? Um, Back to Patrick. Patrick, thank you so much for that very timely bit of uh, family story from your archives. Much appreciated. Janice Blake and David Money kindly bought me several Calvados through the Buy Me A Coffee feature on the home page. And as I've previously mentioned on the show... These proceeds will go to the Salvation Army in support of their many honest exploits on various fronts. Thank you guys, both of you. Thank you very much. And hot off the press, staunch supporter and contributor to the show, Sidney Topf has also just made a very generous Calvadozic contribution to the show. Many thanks, Sidney. And I will remind everyone that I'm currently donating these contributions to the Salvation Army. And somebody asked, uh, what, what is Calvados? I have covered it on the show before, but Calvados is an apple brandy from the Normandy region of France. Uh, something very nice to savour on a cold winter's evening, or a warm summer's evening, or a pleasant spring morning, or <laughs> any time really. Um, Paul Gibson from the UK said Paul I've just discovered your podcast as I'm interested in World War 2 Bomber Command and the courageous stories that have taken place Um, great work I listen to them on my morning work and become engrossed thank you and uh, from one Paul to another to let you know I'm actually looking at another self-published Bomber Command memoir at the moment and it sounds brilliant so 
I do hope to be covering that in a future episode. The the trouble is at the moment, I've got several interviews and stories on my hands and it's about prioritising stuff really. Uh, before long, I'm going to give a, a full status report on all these projects so you know what's coming up. Chip Henneman has written in, Hi Paul, I was five years old when I became interested in World War II and that's many years ago now. That interest has turned into a passion where I started the World War II era Preservation Society. I've got close to 5,000 items in my collection from all over the world. My godmother, Mademoiselle Jeanne Perrachon, was a member of the French Resistance in the Lyon area and she shared with me a few of her stories along with giving me items that she'd saved from the war, including the identification that her cell of the resistance used, a specially produced 20-franc note. And uh, there's a pic in the show notes. If you look carefully, you'll see a picture of Hitler in the bottom left-hand corner, and he's got the fisherman's rope around his neck. Fascinating. Mademoiselle was part of the Pat O'Leary line, one of the escape routes for Allied soldiers and airmen with over 5,000 soldiers and airmen using this route. Mademoiselle shared with me that she'd take messages to different members of the organisation, gather information on German and Vichy French units in the area and helped to escort Allied soldiers and airmen to different safe houses throughout the area. She never participated in any direct sabotage of the German or Vichy French infrastructure, um, at least not that she shared with me. One of the reasons she didn't share a lot with me was due to her fiancé. She never told me his name, but did share that he was betrayed by someone arrested by the Vichy police and turned over to the Gestapo in 1944. All that she knew was that he was sent to a concentration camp in Germany in August 44 and executed in the December. She never found out what happened to his remains. She did share that the person who betrayed him and several others was killed by members of the resistance after the liberation of Lyon in 1944. There's a poster printed up by de Gaulle and posted all over France as a morale booster, telling the French people they might have lost a battle, but not the entire war. She told me that the Germans were ripping down all these posters and destroying them, but she took this one off a wall, rolled it up and hid it under her nurse's cape. She'd seen several Frenchmen beaten by Germans who were found with this poster. It's a photo in the show notes. Another photo I've got is of Isabelle Pell. She was an American socialite whose family had a house in France. Ms. Pell worked with the resistance and Mademoiselle told me that she'd, mess, she'd met Miss Pell a few times during the war and that they remained in contact after the war. So that's a photograph of Chip's godmother uh, signed by Miss um, Pell. Chip, thanks for that lovely great stuff and if you have any more stories i'm all dog's ears Do talking about dogs philip quinn wonders if i've covered the story of horry the war dog well no i haven't philip he was a wonderful pup attached to my uncle norm's crew in the middle east he was a small egyptian terrier taken as mascot by the australian second of the first machine gun battalion and because of his good hearing, he'd warn the diggers of the approaching Stuckers and other planes. My Uncle Norm was a machine gunner, and he had a pick of horry in his caravan at our house in the 1970s. I wish I could go back and talk to Uncle Norm about horry and all the other things he did in World War II, Greece, Middle East and Balak Papan. There's a few pics of the little dog in the show notes and one or two others worth looking at. Captain Papalia. Captain Papalia. Captain James Papalia. Are you there? <laughs> I 
This one's for you, James. You're a top listener, and your dad, Frank, sent me this story absolutely ages ago. Um, I've mentioned Frank and son, James, before, but sometimes the odd bits of feedback slip through the cracks, and I found this in a recent sweep-up. In fact, I'd been saving it for a special Japanese episode, but uh, what the heck, I thought I'd I'd cover it now, because it's such a good story. Um, Frank said, my grandfather... James's great-grandfather was in Korea. My other is Iwo Jima in Japan. And my father-in-law is a decorated silver star from the Vietnam conflict. So we have plenty of first-hand history in our family's four walls. In 2002, I had the good fortune of meeting United States World War II veterans Lester Tenney and Frank Bigelow. I was working for a United States congressman and those two gentlemen were suing the Japanese government for their treatment during the Bataan death march. Congressman Hunter shut down the office and called the whole staff in and let us listen. It was fascinating. Lester Tenney had written a book and was telling stories about the beatings, beheadings and murders as well as the starvation diet they were fed. Talked about how they had to hold guys up who were failing in health, and if they didn't, they'd be killed instantly. This was especially difficult when they themselves were suffering. He cried, pride and bad memories, but was proud to have withstood it. And equally sad for the men he saw die. He felt blame and shame for surviving. His story was amazing. But it was Frank Bigelow, who was probably in his late 70s, early 80s at the time, and still a very large man, who told such an interesting story. He mentioned that he had to have his leg amputated by his own people. A boulder fell on him and it became infected, and they tried to splint it and fix it, but the bank, but the gangrene began to set in. So six of his buddies held him down and amputated it with whatever tools they could find. He said how he couldn't remember how he dealt with the pain, but that he'd had no choice and he just did it. He told another story I'll never forget about being on the coal crushing machine after this event and he was shivering from infection. A Japanese soldier came up from behind him and tried to strangle him out. Mr Bigelow showed us what happened next. He said with every ounce of energy, he threw him off him and punched him in the nose. When he showed us the punch, you noticed how big his hand was and the sound of one hand punching his other hand was still loud and packed a punch. He said he might have been dead, and laid him on the coal crusher. When he was crushed, he called for help to save him. When the Japanese officials arrived, he said he'd struggled to stop the machine, but called for help when the officer fell. They gave him a can of pineapple, and let him have a week's rest. He said, If I win my lawsuit, I'll give them back the money for the pineapple. (laughs) When I went home to visit my parents, I began asking the grandparents about their war stories, and as I mentioned, this started off my interest in the war. That in turn has led to my son James being very interested himself. So there you go James, you owe your interest in history, World War II history in particular, to a pineapple. Frank, thank you so much for sending that one in. Right, we've come to the last um, contribution. That's one from me. It's uh, all about bully beef, beans and chips. (laughs) Um, What is bully beef? Dwayne Harris asked once in a random comment in the middle of a conversation I was having with him. Well, that's bully beef. Star of so many memoirs and memories from my dad to the late Wilf Shaw, and especially Wilf. Bully beef with chips, with hash, with baked beans. Best if served from the back of a burnt-out ambulance found in the Dunkirk, France area, about 1940. But if not, 
just go to your local store and ask for a can of Heinz baked beans. Not green beans, butter beans, broad beans, split beans or even spilt beans, but orange coloured beans served piping hot in tomato sauce. I think Heinz use haricot beans, sometimes also known as navy beans. If you've never heard of them, try a delicatessen. In England, they're all over the place. So I, re- I really don't know why I'm telling you all this, but um, there's plenty of people around the world who probably don't. In, in the UK, we can get Heinz, HP, Branston, and a plethora of supermarket own brands. But I'm guessing... In some parts of the world, like Idaho, Australia and Hong Kong, they're just museum curiosities on the what we used to eat shelf. If you're going to eat it cold, best kept in the fridge and then thinly slice it before serving. But take care when opening the tin because they have a little key that you wind round the tin to wind open the seal and the tins are deadly sharp so watch your fingers and don't do what the very nearly late listener Dwayne Harris did when he nearly chopped off something with his chainsaw but I never did hear the story. I often refer to information from Wikipedia Um, so on this occasion no different I'm going to just cover a little bit about what they say about bully beef Um, it's also known as corned beef in the uk and ireland and it refers to a variety of meat made from finely minced corned beef in a small amount of gelatin and the name bully beef comes from the french bouilli meaning boiled but it's spelt b-o-u-i double l-i so it looks like bully and that's obviously where it comes from the name but um Bully beef and hardtack biscuits were the main field rations of the British Army from the Boer War to World War Two, and it's commonly served sliced in a corned beef sandwich. Oh yeah, potato-based dishes such as hash and hotchpotch, in which the potatoes and beef are stewed together, and corned beef hash, where pre-boiled potatoes and corned beef are mixed with Worcester sauce and then fried. And I've got fond personal memories of corned beef hash when I was in the Boy Scouts when I were a lad. And uh, I remember we were out on scout camp. It was an overnight hike, just a few of us. And the patrol leader made up some corned beef hash. And it was tins of corned beef mixed up with hot mashed potato, all mixed up into one big sort of orangey lump. And uh, I think we had some peas with it as well, but it was absolutely gorgeous. Um, there are some places where British troops had a heavy presence in the 20th century, uh, such as Malta, and they've adopted bully beef as part of their national cuisine. And as recently as 2009, the British Defence Equipment and Support announced that they would be facing out bully beef from ration packs as part of the introduction of the new multi-climate ration packs. Anybody know what's in one of those? do share so if you've got a bully beef story please do share it and uh, if you prefer to (laughs) if you prefer to to remain anonymous as to admitting that you sometimes still eat this stuff just say um you know this is going to be a a bit like that paolo bonini tells when he got back to me about five years after i'd asked who the solitary listener in cambodia was and uh, be jabers, Paolo, Paolo wrote in, bless him. And uh, I guess another five years from now, we're, we're going to be listening to someone's great-grandma's bully beef recipe and how she kept a squad of 18 Germans at bay with it in World War II. Oh, dear. But sticking with Paolo for a minute, other places where I only have one listener, just a few, are Christmas Island, the Maldives... And I'll, I'll go on, then I'll break the rule. Two people freezing their jaxies off, whatever that means, in Antarctica. Now that could be interesting. This is like one of those one of those postcode lotteries, except there's no prize apart from hearing your name in glorious esteem on the Fighting Through podcast. So drop me a line and tell me your story. Maldives, Christmas Island, ooh, December Christmas special. I hear you think, and Antarctica. And that's the end. And just for the heck of it, I'm going to let you listen to one more rendition of Voyage of War by Mark Peters.
but not before I share one last little uh, bit of an excerpt about Bully Beef from uh, a certain person's interview from some time ago. This is from episode four, and this is Wolf entertaining us with his, regaling us with his stories of Bully Beef. So let's have a big fighting through fan welcome for Wilf Shaw, everybody. What food do you recall eating most in the often? Army. Yeah, in the army. I remember we got these tins of uh, bacon that were sent, you know, sealed in, in right. tins, really great lumps of bacon. And then bully beef, of course. And what do you tend to eat? Do you have? We, we got so much bloody bully beef, bully beef for everything. Yeah. Do you eat it? Used to try and disguise it with <laughs> bully beef battered, <laughs> bully beef stew. Ah <laughs> 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 oh dear! You've been listening to the Fighting Through podcast. That was Wolf Shaw, and this is some music called Voyage of War by Mark. Peters, available from your usual music source. I'm Paul Cheel saying bye bye now.